Good evening. Good evening. A special welcome to our guests and visitors today. As we gather, we continue our series on Define a Christian and the Christian trusts God to provide. You now, there's many situations that a person may face uh, as a Christian or not, but even in those difficult situations where it may seem like, how am I going to get through this? We, we trust in our Lord that he is always watching over us. So we ask the Lord to bless our worship today, and we begin with our opening hymn.
Please stand. We begin today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, you are the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, for it is evening, and the day is almost done. Let your light scatter the darkness. Let it shine in our hearts and lives. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, and in our deeds, and in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver and restore us, that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we have been bought back from sin, death, and hell by the perfect life and innocent death of Jesus Christ. In him we are forgiven. Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun, when we shall serve him in newness of life. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and willing to give far more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to accept, ask, accept through the merits and meditation of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We join us singing the Psalms of the day. first lesson for today is 1 Kings chapter 17 verses 1 to 6. This will serve as our sermon Bible study for today. Elijah told the wicked, the wicked king God, God would send years of drought and famine. In those dark times the Lord provided food for his faithful prophet. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives whom I serve, 
There will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Kirith ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to Kirith Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravine ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. This is the word of the Lord. The second lesson is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 10. Before the world was formed, God chose us to be his beloved children. This is why we can trust God to provide. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his present pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace, that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he proposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the time reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand in our respect for the gospel. The gospel today is Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. Jesus graciously and abundantly provides for the needs of a great multitude. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the town. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the village and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. This is the gospel of our Lord. We join in confessing our faith using the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated.
grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We've been doing this kind of sermon Bible study thing. If you haven't been around here, this is kind of something that we've been doing. We have these little child um, devotional books that we've handed out to some of our, our members and our mer- members have purchased. Maybe you have one of these at home. But essentially, you've been kind of focusing on, on the Bible accounts in those books so that our, our families and our members can go home and read those Bible accounts with their children or by themselves and kind of refresh in this kind of simple way, but also maybe dive into the Bible and read these accounts uh, for yourselves as well. Um, I'm not going to read the account today. We heard part of it in our our reading for today, and you can go home and and read it like I I said. But I'll I'll give us a little bit of an introduction here. Maybe you picked up a sheet on your way in. Imagine yourself at the edge of a dusty road in Israel. A figure appears on the distant horizon. As the figure nears, you notice his rugged clothing and focused gaze. This man is Elijah, a prophet of the Most High. He appears without warning to declare a drought, a divine judgment on a nation consumed by idolatry under King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Fast forward, and the drought's effects have swept across the land, affecting many lives, including Elijah's. You can almost feel the anxiety that could have gripped him, But in the following narrative of 1 Kings chapter 17, we see God's promises come to life. God supplies for Elijah's needs in the most unexpected way, through ravens and a widow in Zarephath. In this study, we will explore the extraordinary ways God provided for Elijah, the widow, and her son. So we've been kind of going into things that kind of I think are interesting as you look at the text before us. And it doesn't matter what part of scripture you read. You know, it's always good to slow down and really contemplate what is being said in the pages of of God's word. And so the first question that we're going to consider today is impact of the drought on life and faith. How do you think the drought influenced the peoples of Elijah's day, daily lives, and spiritual perspective. So again, you don't have to answer. You can just sit down and kind of think about it. I'll give you a short answer and a longer answer. But kind of the shorter answer would be people could give, you know, different answers to the impact that a drought would have on the land in people's lives, correct? And and as you could dive into a variety of those, and we will in a short little bit. But, you know, the, the important thing that God is trying to demonstrate with this drought is that he is God. He is the only God. And if you worship other gods, they are no gods at all, and they have no control over the weather or anything. But our God is the one who who gives us life, who who gives us nourishment for our lives. You know, so for today, you you kind of jump into 1 Kings chapter 17 here, and you are in the northern tribes of Israel, all right? And there you see this prophet, the prophet Elijah. And the king at that time in those northern tribes was King Ahab. And King Ahab was a very wicked king. And he married essentially a a heathen woman who became his queen, Queen Jezebel. And she would torture and try to chase after God's prophets in so many ways. You you can go to a a few verses before uh, chapter 17 and chapter 16 and hear this. He considered it a tribal thing to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. He married Jezebel, daughter of Ethabel, king of the Sidonians, and he served Baal and bowed down to him. He erected an altar to Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab made an Asherah pole and did even more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who had gone before him. You know, does this sound like a king that is supposed to be following the Lord? You know, does this sound like a king that worships the Lord above anything else? Certainly not. You you see a king who is worshiping a god they called Baal or Baal. He is worshiping this pole they call the Asherah pole. They're worshiping man-made items or 
gods of their own making and mind. And he didn't, wanted nothing to do, neither his wife, with God or the word that they had to share. So God sends the prophet Elijah to King Ahab to rebuke him. Imagine the task that, that would be to go to the, the ruler of the nations and to correct them on their, their, their ungodly living. You know, that, that would be quite uh, difficult to do, I think. But we hear this. Elijah from Tishba, one of the settlers in Gilead, said to Ahab, As surely as the Lord lives, the God of Israel before whom I stand, there will be no dew or rain, during the coming years, except at my word. You know, how was God punishing their unbelief? You know, he, he rebukes them, and then they endure this kind of physical reality and difficult aspect to their lives, where God now says there is a drought that is going to cover the, the land. And you can go elsewhere in scriptures, and they tell us that it lasted three and a half years. Three and a half years without any rain or sprinkle. Rivers and streams were drying up. You know, you can imagine the difficult life that this would bring. You know, you, you think about, you know, not being able to grow plants or eventually not being able to sustain livestock. You know, you think about this impact that it would have on your life as just a, a normal human being who needs water, who, 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 who needs it to avoid being dehydrated and possibly dying from it. You know, if you don't have food to eat, you know, you, people have to then import it from other nations. You can imagine how expensive that would have been. You know, it would have been hard to feed your armies and protect your lands. You know, there's a lot of ways a drought could impact a person's life. And it certainly did. And it impacted King Ahab's and Jezebel's life. And it even impacted Elijah's life as well. You know, you, you think about how this is, again, a, a reality of showing who the true God is. You know, is your God, Baal, the one who brings water upon the earth? It doesn't seem like it, but the God of Elijah, the, the God of all the universe, is the God who created all things, the Lord himself, is the one who sustains this world and keeps it going, and he could strike it down and end it right here and right now if he so chooses. So again, you see this impact that it would have had on their life, but also on their spiritual perspective. So maybe we ask uh, this question then. God provides for Elijah in the Kirith Ravine. In the first Kings, chapter 17, verse 2 to 5, God guides Elijah to the Kirith Ravine and promises to stay, sustain him there. How does God provide for Elijah during this terrible drought? No, God is not going to stop caring for his people. God is not going to stop caring for his prophet Elijah, his spokesperson. And so he encourages Elijah, commands Elijah to go to this Kareth ravine, and there he would find you know, water to drink. There he would find these ravens that would bring him bread and meat in the morning and the evening to give him nutrients for life. You know, God provides for him. And so, could you imagine them being Elijah? Could you imagine Elijah, you know, you, you give this kind of sentence that this drought is going to happen, but this drought also impacts you. You know, you're the one who's trying to find water. You're the one trying to find food. You know, you wonder what kind of prayers Elijah prayed to the Lord. You know, was he praying, Lord, give me water and food so that I can have nutrients? Was he saying, Lord, you know, take this drought away and, and provide for your people? Have mercy on them as, as sinners? You know, we, we don't know what Elijah was praying, but we do know what the Lord did. The Lord provided for him in this kind of natural way and miraculous way. 
And, and, and before we maybe get into that, it's important to understand how God provides for us. He provides for us in two ways. He provides for us in this natural means. You know, you can think about it in this way. You have a job. You, you work to get money. And then you go to the grocery store and you pay for the food that other people took the time to grow. Or maybe you go to the farmer's market and you pay the, the farmer. Or maybe you have a garden in your yard that has food. And you, you grow that and it sustains you. God provides for us in a natural way. But he also provides for us in a miraculous way too, maybe at times. In a way that it doesn't comprehend with our mind. It doesn't even involve our hands. Maybe you think about all these different ways in the Old Testament where he provides for his people, maybe with manna. You know, God can provide for his people in many ways. And so here, Elijah is going where the Lord has told him, and he provides him with a natural stream, with water he could drink, and then he sends these ravens, again, in the morning and evening, bringing bread and meat to him day after day after day. And, and, you know, it's amazing that God used ravens. They were considered unclean birds, you know, and they were not very friendly birds to be around, but God used these unclean, these unfriendly birds to bring food to Elijah in this miraculous way. You know, it kind of just leaves you kind of speechless and thinking, wow, you know, the things that God can do uh, for his people. But God isn't done. This goes beyond our, our, our readings for today, but uh, God's faithfulness and trustworthiness. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 7 to 16, so if you go home and read on, you'll hear about this. How does God's actions in helping Elijah, the widow at Zarephath, and her son show that he is dependable and trustworthy? Certainly this shows God is using this woman, so God sends uh, Elijah to this widow in Zarephath to provide for him, to give him nutrients and life. And God, God at the same time provides for this widow at Zarephath and her son by allowing the, the, flour, the bowls and the containers of flour and oil not to run out until there would be rain again. So, again, we are told how bad this drought was. After some time, the stream dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Get up, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there. I have commanded a woman there, a widow, to provide for you. Again, the Lord is thinking about his prophet. He's thinking about how to provide for them, him in this way maybe through an unknown widow that may, many people probably didn't know or really care about. But the thing that might seem a little intriguing to us is that here Elijah goes to this widow and they're not in the best situation either, either because of the drought. We hear, she said, As surely as the Lord your God lives, I have no food except a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a pitcher. See, I am gathering a couple of sticks so that I can go and prepare it for myself and my son so that we can eat and then die. You know, it, 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 when you kind of think of Elijah asking this wo widow and her son to give, them, to give him their last food, it feels a little heartless. You know, why would he ask for their last food? You know, does he just want them to starve faster? But the thing is, Elijah trusted the Lord. And we see that the widow and the son also trusted the Lord. That God would keep his promise to continue to feed them as well. Elijah told her, Do not be afraid. Go and do just as you said. But first make a small loaf of bread for me from the flour and bring it out to me. Then go and make another for you and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not run out, and the pitcher of oil will not become empty until the day the Lord sends rain to water the surface of the ground. You know, the, the widow did exactly as Elijah had said. She trusted the Lord. 
No, she could have just said, forget you, I don't know who you are. You know, I'm just going to have this meal, and then we're going to die anyways. At least we'll have something to maybe make us last a little longer. But what does she do? She prepares a, 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 a loaf, a, a piece of bread for him and them. And God provides for them. Where, where the flour doesn't run out, the oil doesn't run out either, and they are sustained and cared for. You know, you see God's power and his love. So, why does this matter to me? Why does this matter to you? You know, the, you, know you think, you look at this account, and you're just like, wow, that's amazing, you know, that, that, that's nice to hear. But how does that apply to our lives? Can you recall a time when you found it difficult to trust that God would provide for your needs? It probably isn't hard to think of times, right? It may be in your life where you, you wondered, you know, how will I make it through? Maybe you were struggling to buy food to put on the table. Maybe you were struggling to pay the bills. Maybe you were struggling to buy clothes for the children. You know, you think of all these different ways but who provides for us? God does. So, again, life can be challenging in, in so many ways. Sometimes the challenges can come because of natural means. Maybe it's a drought. Maybe it's an illness that plagues the, the world. Maybe it's a, a tornado that goes through or a hurricane or a flood that destroys everything. And it leaves you wondering... You know, how can I provide for myself? Or, or maybe it's more, you know, within us. Maybe you, you lose your job. Maybe you're in this mental state where you're struggling to keep on moving and keep on providing for yourself. Maybe you're enduring this hardship because you, you're, you're worried you're going to lose your job. Or, or maybe you've lost a spouse and you start thinking, you know, where are all my things going to come from? You know, maybe your retirement you know, account seems to be going down faster than you had expected. No, oh, how am I going to get what I need? And maybe we look at ourselves in a certain way and say, you know, I need to try harder. I need to, you know, work harder. And maybe there is a little bit of truth in that in a certain degree. Maybe we have to make better use of God's gifts. You know, do we use them faithfully? Or do we just waste them and kind of throw them around? You know, that's something to think about. But, you know, we must understand that God is the one who gives us all things. Who gives us everything that, that we need. And most likely you can look around in your house and see that God has provided you with a lot more than maybe you, we actually need. Uh, you think about, you know, how, how God provides for us in these miraculous ways that he gives us life, he gives us food to eat on the table, that he gives us a home and a bed, and that we should praise him for that. But so often, we, we, we don't go to him first. We, we think of ourselves and say, yeah, again, maybe I, I need to do this, I need to try harder. Or, or maybe when we do go to God, we're, we're praying for things that, you know, do we really need you know, are they just luxuries that we end up praying to God for? Or, and, you know, do we really put our trust in Him that He will provide for us? And even if we lost our home, or lost all that we had, would we not still praise the Lord? Would we not give Him thanks for all that He has done for us? But so often we're ungrateful for what God has given us. <coughs> We're so ungrateful that he hasn't given us this or this that we think we should have. And if we question God with our earthly, you know, lives and that we doubt that he'll provide for us, how much more do we doubt that he'll take care of us spiritually? That he'll watch over us and care for our spiritual needs? And if we doubt that, we are in trouble, most certainly. But what does our, our God do? He loves us and provides for us. God provides for us in many ways, some of which we may overlook. How do you see God's provision in your life? Not just physically, but most importantly, spiritually. 
Yes, God does provide for you physically. Again, you probably can think that, you know, all the food that's in the refrigerator, you know, the, the, the table that you can eat at, the home that you have, um, the, the bed that you can sleep on, the clothing that you can wear. But God provides us with even greater gifts. The forgiveness of sins, life with Him. In the Old Testament, you can see how God provides for His people over and over again in these wonderful ways. You can see it here with Elijah again. You can see it with the Israelites with manna. You can see it in many places in the Bible even, even in the New Testament with our Gospel reading for today, Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. We see Jesus providing for a crowd's physical needs by feeding them with five loaves of fish, five loaves of bread and two fish. You know, he, he cares for them. Does Jesus care that their, their bodies are taken care of? Yes. Does, does he, he want to give them food in this instance? Yes. But does God also care about their spiritual needs? Yes. Does God care about their eternal lives? Most certainly. And we see that because Jesus is there living and breathing as the, the God-man that he was and is. He is the one who came into this world to forgive sinners like you. He is the one to provide us with salvation and eternal life so that we can have life with him eternally, now and forever. Because of his death on this uh, cross, in the resurrection that he did for us. So you think about how God provides for us and how much that means to us. That we want to give back to him. That we want to say thank you, Lord, for all that you have done. So uh, a simple question to ask, um, children or adults, I, I think it is important for us to focus on uh, children and their time in God's word. You know, we, we want to instill this, yes, in church and teach our children. Yes, it's important to have our children in church, to have this time in God's Word at home. You know, sometimes I'm at home around the dinner table, and my kids start quoting parts of, you know, the service that we have at, at the table. And I'm like, where did they pick this up? But it's kind of like, duh, Dad, and they picked it up at church. You know, they're, they're reciting things that they hear Dad say, you know, about the Lord's Supper or, or throughout the, the service. You know, so they're listening. They're paying attention. You're instilling this truth in them that this will last for all their days. And when they're in trouble, even at their young age, again, you can say, you know, Jesus loves you. So here's this question I want to ask today. And maybe you can ask your kids. How does God provide what you need in life. And, and you might ask them, you know, do, do you have a job? And they would probably say, no. Mom and dad have the job. You have the job. You know, you, and you say, thank you, Lord, for providing me with parents or grandparents or friends that give me life, that give me food and clothing, a house to live. You know, thank you, Lord, for providing for me in these ways because I don't deserve that. But then you can tell them, you know, Lord, you know, the, the Lord that we believe in, the Jesus that lived for you, died for you. He provided you with eternal life. Where there will be a banquet feast in heaven, where we will enjoy that now and forever, and you get to know that is yours as a Christian. No matter if you're 2 or 10, 40 or 50 or 80 or 90, you know, God provides for us, and he'll always provide for us eternally in heaven. So here's a little passage that you can memorize at home or meditate on. Philippians 4, verse 19, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Where do all things come from? God. And he is the one to be praised. So uh, you can go home and, you know, read the devotion and have this prayer. Um, so you have everything there for you. So we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, in the light of Elijah's story or account, we are reminded of your unwavering care for your people. Help us anchor our faith in you, especially in challenging times, and remember that you care, care for your physical and spiritual needs. 
as you promised in Philippians 4 verse 19, you will provide according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Guide us to trust in you, our ultimate provider. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God is to pass all understanding of your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue with the celebration of the Lord's let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God of grace and truth, you provided for us all that we need and so much more. For this we, we praise you. And even if we, we lose all the things that we have, we will continue to praise you as the God of the universe and the God who created all things, including us. But we thank you for providing for us and giving us life now in this world, but eternally as your children through Jesus Christ, so that we can have life with you in heaven and all that we need now and for all eternity while we, we are with you. Amen. And we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and keep us. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We join in singing our closing hymn, Amazing Grace. Good evening. Good evening. A special welcome to our guests and visitors. It's always a pleasure to have you. Um, a couple of uh, announcements. I will be um, going on vacation from the 7th to the 20th. Um, that will be two weeks. Um, we will be having a visitor uh, for the Sunday services here. Uh, Dan Kaminsky will be doing the first Thursday service, but then for the next Thursday service, we'll have Pastor Meislick coming down. 
um, in leading service for us. Um, he owes me one because I helped him out when he went on vacation. Um, so, um, and then we're going to have two guest preachers on Sunday here um, at St. Paul's. The first week, Zach will be doing it. And the second week on the 20th, the guest preacher that is here was willing to go also up there um, as well. Um, if you need anything, Pastor Meislick was willing to um, be on call. Um, so in case of an emergency, please contact him um, and that number. Um, I will not be looking at my emails, and my wife will be reminding me of that. Um, and I probably will be putting my phone away for most of the trip. So um, just kind of letting you know that if you're trying to contact me, I might not even see it um, during those weeks there. And just thank you for your cooperation um, to make that happen um, and uh, keep things running. The church picnic, we hope we can have uh, most of our church family join us for that day. It's September 10th. It'll also be uh, a potluck, and we'll have games and activities and prizes again. And it also will be registration for Sunday school as well. So if you'd like to enroll your kids at, in Sunday school here at Calvary, um, you can do that on the 10th and join us for that picnic as well. Um, I think it'll be a, a nice day, and hopefully it'll be a nice, nice weather as well. Um, I think for that, I'll, I'll stop there for now. God's blessings on the rest of your week.